or from I assume the high school principal. It would do the faculty good to read read this particular overview. Uh, we will now move on to communication from funding coalition. Um, I understand that the town council last night had a discussion about this communication, um, and uh, I had a brief conversation with Michael McGovern uh, about it. Frankly, um, it is an issue that has been talked about in some neighboring communities, uh, one which we looked briefly at last year, not necessarily this particular proposal, but uh, some related proposals, and felt that uh, we were in a somewhat separate category and that we really did not have um, absolute shared interests. Uh, frankly, I haven't had time to research this. I just received it in time to put it into your packet for your perusal. I would point out a couple of things that the towns that are listed here, for the most part, receive less subsidy than we do. Um, only one other receives uh, about the same amount. And um, therefore, again, I had simply want to point out that we are in a different category. I have asked uh, uh, our business manager to research some of the background information here to, get, to report back to me uh, and to you as to um, what uh, analysis it might yield for us. But at the present time, all I am really doing is um, passing this on to you, um, letting you know that there is this conversation going on. I think we have to do some research to figure out what this kind of proposal might mean for us. It mentions income, for instance, and uh, I know from some very preliminary figures that I saw last year with some discussion about changes in the funding formula, that uh, would probably hurt us. And uh, I think we need to see some playing out what ifs uh, before we are prepared to make any uh, recommendation to you. The um, town council deferred any action on this pending um, review by the school board, so they're waiting for any kind of input from us, whether they will take this up again. So I agree. We, I think we need some more information how this really impacts us, how some of our stats compare to, to other community stats and what we have to gain or not gain. I mean, some of their points are very, you know, look very valid, things that are, are lacking in the formula. But I, I think we really need to look at what really is impacting us. Anyone else? Rosemary? Well, I would like to just say um, for the public or anyone on the board who did not realize, there's also a price tag uh, associated with this for us, which is a cost of approximately $1,600. And I just caution that we don't have a lot of money to be spending at this time and would add that to the reason to uh, do further research. You could join, but as a, as a non-paying, non-voting member, just to give your support. So that's also an option. I, I just have one comment. Uh, to get involved in this, I think there would have to be a, a committee or perhaps just an individual would really want to dig into the school funding formula and then see how it would impact our town and uh, then go forth and advocate appropriately. Uh, it's a big job. I have taken a look at the school funding formula from time to time and uh, a few years ago I went to probably one of the predecessor organization meetings of this, uh, this entity and spent an evening being exposed to many different points of view. Uh, but my conclusion is that it really would take somebody who would like to dig into this financial crossword puzzle and get to know it really well and get to know how it would uh, affect uh, Cape Elizabeth. Uh, if we don't have anybody or uh, a group that wants to do that, I think it's academic. I see a lot of hands going up for people <laughs> who want to dig right into this, but uh, uh, maybe there's some viewers out there. That, uh, I think some of the examples cited in the communique are things that we could get a handle on without a lot of extensive research. I don't think these were hard things for them to pull out. I, I would like to see how we would compare in comparison to some of these other examples. This did impress a couple council members last night, some of these examples of the, what appear to be inequities in the current formula in some of these low receiving and high receiving communities. 
So, and we will continue to investigate and inquire. Um, we will now move on to the school board subcommittees and reports, and the first one will be from the finance subcommittee, and I will yield to the chairman, Rosemary. Thank you. Um, the finance committee meeting of November 10th, 1992, started at 6.30 tonight, and the items that were reviewed were the uh, weight room at the high school, the work that the um, code uh, was not properly done on the fire chief had some concerns. That work will be done during Thanksgiving uh, break. We also reviewed the uh, letter from the town of Falmouth that was just discussed in the prior agenda item. We looked at the statuses of the bus. If anyone is wondering where bus seven is, it still is not back. Uh, we have reviewed and received the financial statements um, for the month ending October 31st, 1992, with no remarkable uh, entries. Uh, we have we reviewed and signed the warrants, and that is about the extent of the business that we conducted in the hour before this meeting. Any questions of the chairman? Seeing none, we will now move on to the policy subcommittee and I yield to the chairman, Loretta Pond. Thank you. Uh, on October 28th, the policy committee met in, in Dr. Goldman's office and discussed uh, several different administrative guideline policies that we uh, uh, needed to, to go over. One, one had to do with substitute pay. We had had inquiries about whether our pay scale was in fact comparable to other communities and and uh, we uh, came up with the uh, decision that it was in fact very sufficient and that we were not having any difficulties getting substitutes and that our pays were in our pay was in line with other communities um, we also discussed student fundraisers with corporations in the community for instance tomorrow the junior class is is having a, uh, a fundraiser where they work at Burger King and in the funds that Burger King makes for certain hours of the day, uh, a percentage of that goes to the class. And we really have not reached uh, a decision about that and would appreciate input from you if you uh, have any, any thoughts about that. And we'll be uh, continuing to discuss that at later meetings. We talked about uh, loaning books to paro parochial students, books that that uh, that we have in excess in our own in our own school. Not buying their books for them, but loaning them books if they, in fact, are are the same text that that our students use. And uh, we'll continue. To, we'll, we'll be making a decision about that. Uh, the special education policies are being reviewed by Wayne Dore and the community service policies are being reviewed by Sue Weatherby. And the, the committee will be meeting again on December 2nd at 10 o'clock. And just as a review for anyone in, in the audience or, or anyone that would be interested, the policy committee consists of Jan Solon and Peter Leslie and, and, and me and Dr. Goldman. And so if you have any questions about policies and we would be the ones for you to, to talk to if, if we could be of help. Thank you. Did you want to share any information about the uh, the use of um, companies use, supporting? Or do you, you mean the policy that we, yes. we were talking about? The Just, rest of the board may want to be informed. Okay. Um, one of the issues that, that comes up periodically uh, and the reason I asked the policy subcommittee to look at is because a new wrinkle had occurred uh, is the issue of fundraisers. Um, in general, uh, they are an accepted part of, of the picture, especially at the high school where, you know, bottle drives and car washes and, and what have you. Um, every so often some new wrinkle comes along and I just think it's important for the board to be aware of it. What seems to have surfaced this uh, this year for us, although I understand having done a little more research on this since I, we had a meeting, that it has been going on with some area high schools at least for the last year. 
Um, some eating places are uh, having a Cape Elizabeth night or a Scarborough night or something of that sort. And when we discuss it informally, I said that I would try to get some more specifics and to answer questions about how much money was actually raised. I guess that was number one. <laughs> I mean, is it worth it? Uh, number two, uh, are people feeling uncomfortable about um, using the school name in conjunction with one business and not another? What kind of background information does the uh, do the sponsoring uh, group say? And I understand there has been some, some work trying to gather that kind of data, and I will be meeting with some of the sponsors and getting. So the next time we meet, I'll have a more complete. Uh, and in the meantime, we basically um, felt comfortable with saying for those groups that had um, already set up uh, such a, a fundraiser to, to go ahead and do it, we're not really trying to uh, interfere, but we did want to put a moratorium on a new group continuing until we had a chance to get a handle on it. Um, this whole area of, of how much fundraising can the community absorb, um, where we are, of course, a small town, is something when kids can drive at the high school level, they tend to branch out and go further, and, and then it's another issue. So this will probably be all right, but I think we need to get a little more information and I'll report back to you. Any comments from the board? And we'll defer to the next meeting. Uh, the Town Center Committee, Rosemary Reed. Hi. Yes, the next meeting of the Town Center Committee is uh, November. 18th uh, next Wednesday night we will be discussing uh, more of the town center uses and we'll be focusing on the uh, school campus and the percentage of coverage of the uh, 90 some odd acres that the school is uh, known to uh, or that uses as, as the campus uh, we have also had to extend our deadline from December of 92 until March or April of 93 and I believe that was on the town council's agenda last night and I don't know the outcome but I'm sure if we said we needed more time that they would allow us to complete our charge. I don't believe it was on the agenda. Then I'm sorry. It will I be soon. But <laughs> well, we are asking the town okay. council to amend our charge to give us additional time to complete our task. You answered my question. Uh, when was your final report due? At December. Okay. Um, community team? Uh, yes, the community team um, has taken a new position and that it is uh, now deemed uh, to be in limbo. And the reason for that is an apparent uh, uh, lack of community support at this time for a regular monthly uh, meeting and agenda. The uh, community team, however, is available at the request of the Parents Forum, the Middle School Parents Association, uh, and or the Pond Cove Parents Association to provide advice and support for activities which these organizations undertake which might have a theme consistent with the community team's mission. Uh, the mission of the community team was to promote health and well-being through education, increased awareness, resources, and forums for discussion. It is my understanding that the federal drug-free funds are also, uh, the spending of those is approved by this committee. Uh, yes, we did. you know what's going to happen? We did meet. Uh, we did approve the applications for that, and we did that at the October meeting. Uh, they are monitored uh, by Lyle Kramer. I, excuse me. They are um, controlled by uh, Lyle Kramer and monitored by the community team. And this is not defunct. It is just not operating at this point, and it will be called back to do those things that it is required to do to maintain grant status and other items. It just will not meet on a monthly basis anymore. Any comment from the board? Uh, can, can we go back to the town center? Sure. Committee for a second. We'll we reopen the town way, center so I agenda. I, I just had a couple quick questions for Rosemary. Has, has that committee discussed at all extending the sidewalks on Scott Dyer Road? Yes. Up? 
That's a recommendation. It is a recommendation. How, how it's those school uh, warning lights, I don't know what they're called. Is that also part of what you're discussing? I'll the ones let the superintendent <laughs> answer. That's, that's in my, my court. Uh, I did have a conversation as to how we get them, and I have, um, it is something I have to pursue as far as simply writing to the department to see if they have funds. I understand that they may or may not have funds, but that, and I believe, I, I didn't follow the discussion last night, but I did see in the paper, apparently there was a discussion about lights. The school light is a separate safety item, um, and the person I talked to was not aware of exactly where with all the budget cuts the uh, possibility of our getting those flashing lights uh, actually lay, so I will pursue that, but I don't know the answer to that one at this time. But yes, we did. Uh, uh, excuse me, I, again, on, sure. since we're on, <laughs> on that, uh, I just should share with the board that I had a conversation with a town planner um, about uh, trying to get some specific figures on how much of that campus is covered this is, of course, an issue, especially as we move into a building mode and will be part of the preparation for, for building, how much asphalt covering, et cetera, et cetera. It'll be a DEP issue, I'm sure, at least to be reviewed. Hopefully no problems, but it will have to be reviewed. Um, so I did authorize her to call uh, Frank Walker from Portland Design Team uh, since she had some specific questions that I was not able to answer, and I felt that um, whatever budget item that was would be modest. and I far preferred to have um, him give her precise figures and to give me, I mean, for me to give her some kind of a guesstimate because one of the things that we were both trying to avoid was having the community center come up with a recommendation about setbacks or coverage or percentages of uh, this, that, or the other that somehow would, would uh, put us in an awkward position down the road as we come up with building problems. Uh, we next move on to the MSMA conference, uh, which took place in October. Rosemary Reed and myself participated. Uh, we attended on Thursday and attended some clinics. And I'll let Rosemary tell you about what she attended first. Uh, yes, I attended elementary computing and other scary stuff. This is their title. Um, and how come kindergartners can do it and we can't? And the focus of that was why do our students know more about computers than our teachers and their parents? This was put on by Frank McDermott. He's the assistant superintendent of SAD6 and Cheryl Lawson of the uh, Apple Corporation. Uh, it goes on to say that high tech has invaded the primary classroom and it will never be the same. The presenters talked and demonstrated hardware and software that is becoming commonplace in the elementary classroom. And in fact, the demonstrations, uh, it was the first one in the morning and they were extremely lively. And to say that the books and characters jumped off the screen is uh, really what happened and uh, how kids can write their own stories and uh, do this all on the computer was just uh, beyond me. Uh, but it was very interesting and uh, Actually, they saw this as a possible replacement for textbooks in the future. Uh, funding for this, however, uh, was not part of the discussion. Uh, the next um, clinic that I attended was on reading recovery. And as people know, we have trained our second, or in the process of training our second reading recovery teacher in the first grade. What is it? And I uh, can't work here in Maine. The presenters were the language arts coordinator of reading recovery in Westbrook, uh, Patricia Jackman, uh, and two other reading recovery teachers. And they gave specific examples of students, and they tracked the student from the time the student entered the program until they uh, reluctantly at times left the program and how the statistics had changed. Reading Recovery, which is a trademark, is a, an intervention program that targets the poorest readers in the first grade classrooms. Uh, an overview of the program and the results for the 91-92 year uh, from the town of Westbrook um, was given. And also they talked about the training locations and the numbers of teachers and the statistics and just the, the whole benefit to the student of the Reading Recovery program. Uh, after lunch, I was able to 
uh, go to what was probably the most uh, well-attended clinic of all the ones that day. They kept bringing in more chairs and more people kept coming when they saw the chairs and that was on excellence and equity for all, untracking the public high school. That was given by Pamela Fisher. She's the principal of uh, Noble High School, which is SAD 60. And as our, an anchor uh, learning school, uh, Noble High School is using the nine principles of the Coalition of Essential Schools as a vehicle to implement Maine's common core of learning. Uh, if the goals of uh, your school, they tell the readers, uh, are to apply to all students, the framework in which the school operates must provide equal opportunities. The, the session presented noble strategies for untracking their high school, for providing a positive learning environment for all students, and the methods used to assess the programs to date. And she said that it was uh, a year that everyone dreaded uh, until it started and then things kind of fell into place and uh, the first year Noble started it they did it with the freshman class only and took volunteers and they're moving that class through instead of trying to change the entire uh, high school and uh, it was a very well presented and well received clinic and the final one was uh, full inclusion our schools are for all kids and the regional coordinator of the Lawrence project in Waterville presented Mona Baker and they presented um, the session to highlight the philosophy of inclus inclusive schools and to demonstrate how all students can be successful, grow and learn in regular schools and classrooms when individually designed supports are provided. And they also went on for uh, demonstrating some of the successful strategies as well as personal experiences that the other three presenters uh, had had in their schools. It was a very uh, interesting and jam-packed day. And while I was there, I, collect, I attended three mm -hmm. workshops and then also was your representative to the assembly. Uh, the first one I attended in the morning was Collective Bargaining, Selected Topics, and that was presented by Paul Hurlbert, who was Associate Executive Director for MSMA in, um, in Bargaining and also by Hugh McMahon of uh, Grumman, Woodson, Plimpton, and McMahon uh, law firm in Portland. And they kind of provided an overview of recent decisions of the courts and the Maine Labor Relations Board as they affect Maine school officials. And, and I have a handout of recent decisions by the, by the uh, Maine Labor Relations Board. And the other subjects that they covered are the rights and responsibilities of school officials in connection with salary scale steps when a collective bargaining agreement has expired, insurance, salary, and staff reduction issues. And we also have a handout on selected topics of bargaining, things that we should be looking for in future contracts, negotiations. found it very enlightening. Um, found Hugh McMahon to be very personable and very knowledgeable. Um, the second workshop I attended was the Maine Human Rights Commission procedures that was given by Patricia McDonough of Jensen Bayer Gardner and Henry law firm in Portland and it was more of a nuts and bolts presentation on the procedures before the Human Rights Commission and um, the process etc. Um, there were a lot of questions um, concerning what if, what if, and it, it most of the questions that came from the for the participating audience were more on uh, employees and those kind of uh, human rights issues and not so much on student issues. And then the final one I attended was under, it was called Mental Ground Zero and it was presented by Dr. Judd Smith, uh, the psychologist from Portland. When I got in there and realized who was giving it, I, I had some reservations, but I actually came out, it was a very positive experience. Um, he was looking at all the pressures that are on kids, not just in, in the makeup of their family structure, which is no longer the, the family structure of the 50s, and he, and he kind of called it um, um, the BLT kind of a family. There are so many integral parts to making up the sandwich. That, that we really have to be aware of, of the, the technology pressures that are on kids and how we can utilize those, um, those 
technology um, aspects in helping to educate kids. And it, w it was very positive, and uh, I found him very dynamic. The only interaction I'd ever had with him before, he came once for the PCPA, and, and I wasn't too impressed with him, but he really did a good job with this presentation. Um, and then in the afternoon, I attended um, the, um, the delegate assembly, and essentially were resolutions um, pertaining mainly to uh, the current status of um, the funding and that kind of thing. So nothing really earth shattering. I did observe that it, that a lot of, of parochial um, candidates um, would get up and essentially argue on anything. And uh, it, I found it very interesting. Uh, so I did find a very interesting day. I did enjoy the, um, the uh, bargaining workshop very much and got some insights. Um, we will now move on to unfinished business and discussion and action as needed. Custodial transportation reorganization update. I yield to the superintendent. Okay, I did include a, a memo in your packet trying to boil down some of these issues. Um, the, for weeks, well, for, for several meetings now, we have talked, I have talked about the reorganization of bus routes, uh, custodial functions. Um, uh, we've seen some uh, improvement in some of these areas, uh, but I can assure you that from a budgetary point of view, uh, we are still in the process of reorganizing. Uh, we've now reached a point where we need to review our uh, stipends for uh, supervisory personnel in these custodial maintenance and transportation units. Um, just to clarify that the, uh, th this unit is a collective bargaining unit and uh, the basic hourly pay rate is established through that process. However, our particular contract has language that uh, gives to the, the board the administrative managerial right to, uh, in addition to the basic hourly rate, to assign a stipend for su supervisory personnel. As we've been reorganizing, we have been restructuring uh, the responsibilities of the personnel we have. And in addition, as I pointed out in my memo, we have established a head custodian position, which uh, again is an hourly pay rate position and is one of our, our custodians applied for and was appointed to that position. Um, but it is uh, now time to assign an appropriate stipend to repay him for the extra duties that he's taking on. As I reviewed it, I became aware and looking through past records that the school board has not, does not appear to have been involved over the years in reviewing that structure, understanding it, and formally approving of it. So my process in this one is to bring it to your attention now. Uh, I would suggest that this body take a vote to um, ask the finance subcommittee to formally review the data and the detail, which Sue and I will be happy to share with you. Um, we have some inequities, or I'm not sure they're inequities, but we have some differences in pay. We need to review those. We need to have a rationale for what we are paying and why we are paying it and what our expectations are. Since that is a step over and above the collective bargaining process, then I believe the Finance Subcommittee is the appropriate way to deal with it. Once we have a recommendation from that group, we will come back to you for a vote and then we will have, uh, of course, a written record of why we are paying people what we are paying and make sure that that becomes part of an ongoing, um, not only the personnel folders, but also the board record so that we know what we're doing. Are there any questions of the superintendent? Comments? Uh, Rosemary? No comments. Okay. I have asked the um, policy subcommittee chairman to make a motion on this particular item. You mean finance? I mean the finance, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I would like to make a motion that we request the superintendent to review all prior administrative decisions relating to supervisory stipendent positions for bus drivers, custodial and maintenance staff, and to authorize the sub finance subcommittee to review these recommendations and bring these recommendations to the full board. Do hear a second? And any comment? 
All those in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Um, we now move on to update on issues being discussed in the Diversity Committee. Um, I have shared with you um, before the fact that that committee was set up actually during the summer, and I decided it was time to uh, make sure that you were aware of what was going on with that committee. And I included the minutes. And I included uh, some summary um, material from one of the workshops that's been held at Pond Cove that was a kind of an offshoot of that uh, committee. You may recall we started out talking about teaching tolerance. Our, our initial impetus for this was to make sure that our staff uh, procedures, our staff uh, development, staff training, as well as uh, perhaps some curriculum pieces in student uh, training uh, assured a context of respect mutual respect back and forth regardless of what differences uh, may exist. That, uh, and as we got into these discussions, we discovered that there were seemed to be a lot more differences in, uh, or diversity issues than I would have first thought of. Um, what it is, I think, the, the, the issue that's really important to grasp here, uh, for me anyway, has been the opportunity that this committee seems to be affording people to talk about the climate in our schools. Uh, we have included some students. We've had a couple of students in the middle school. In our last meeting, we had a high school student. We're looking forward to having other high school students join us. Um, and it is not that anything has been revealed that makes it sound as if we are a harsh or um, discriminating uh, setting. If anything, people seem to be trying hard to uh, be open-minded and so forth. But there is, in fact, a problem in the way in which we seem to treat each other. There is a uh, some people are calling it an overly competitive spirit. Some people are calling it um, sort of like a walking on eggs syndrome. Uh, the students themselves are talking about um, a kind of burden about looking over your shoulder, am I doing this right, and so forth. And not talking about teachers making them feel that way, but talking about other students making them feel that way. Um, the, you know, in one meeting we had um, a gentleman present who had uh, uh, had some contacts with a special school that is a school that had it was a private school that had a rather uh, rarefied group of students coming and he talked about the burden of the perfect school uh, that he had heard comments like that before with people who have a sense that they are in a setting that is somehow very special and uh, fear of failure fear of not being as good as somebody else uh, we have heard some discussion, uh, again, among students or secondhand for, or teacher observation about students who, um, who, will, who will, in fact, laugh at another student who may have gotten, I got a 97, you got a 96, haha, I'm better than you are. I mean, it seems like a, a strange piece uh, to complain about in a way, but there's something about that atmosphere and that climate that is disturbing when you listen to discussion. Uh, I included in your packet uh, a piece from the Harvard Education Letter that had to do with why, um, what's the exact title here, I don't want to misquote it. Um, why bright kids get bad grades. Yes, when bright kids get bad grades. And I, it, it struck a real nerve with me, not only from that diversity uh, committee meeting or series of meetings, but some of the things that I've heard from parents and from teachers. Uh, the dilemma of the child who feels uh, and who obviously is capable of learning, who seems to start at school like a house of fire and somewhere along the way damps off like a plant that just puzzlingly sits in the saucer and dies. Um, I happen to know something about this research. I was involved uh, 10 years ago in doing a little bit myself along those lines and it fascinated me that there were um, there were some real interesting issues that get raised when you talk to students, particularly in the upper grade level and at the middle school level, about study habits. I found that students, there were many students, for instance, who seemed to feel that if they had to learn how to study, then they weren't bright and therefore they would resist efforts to teach them how to study. That they had to get it easily and quickly or that it was a loss of self-esteem. And there is something about the model of American factory model labeling and sorting, sifting and sorting mechanisms that seems to breed that mindset among children that to be number one, 
means you're always trying to be number one at somebody else's expense. And it is very disturbing when you think of all the implications that can flow from that. Obviously, uh, since some of us have, have talked about the learning gap, uh, the book that is trying to test the assumptions of American public education by contrasting it with the Asian notions and it talks about the affordability model, um, I think we need to take a real hard look at those issues of climate, not just because, although that's an important issue, we certainly want to teach values to children on a day-to-day -day basis about a just community. We do not want to, to have a, a school setting where there's any question of whether or not you're going to be respected and whether you in turn respect somebody else. But I also think there are academic implications. And I think that uh, one of the goals I have for this year is to, to um, continue to work on, in fact, I've already started to work on this, framing some, some parent and staff conversations, kind of a dialogue too, if you will, um, on some of these specific issues. Because I do believe that when you talk about why change, that many times people don't understand why they're so puzzled about why isn't this working better than it seems to be working. And I think that this is one issue. Respect starts with respecting yourself so that you can respect others. And we need to give a good hard look at some of the issues that go on both academically as well as in behavior. And uh, I think that those are some of the issues that are coming out of that diversity committee. Another uh, more perhaps um, nuts and bolts issue is that we're hearing a lot about behavior. And I know that uh, in your goal setting session that, that that issue of discipline, you know, was raised. Um, I am concerned about the, uh, about the problems we're having at, um, you know, at the Pond Cove playground. And I'm, I applaud the administration and the staff and the parent committee that's working on that to work to teach kids how, how respect plays out in day-to-day -day ways, uh, including how you act on the playground, to say nothing of how you act in the classroom. Um, so that, in, in essence, what we're struggling with, and I included in the uh, packet a timeline, you could see that we started out by reviewing policies. We looked at our discipline policies. Uh, you reviewed those at the end of the summer. We looked at uh, some other related policies in general. Uh, but we're also now at the point where we're trying to analyze the, um, the, the, the somewhat puzzling uh, and sometimes uh, almost confusing uh, comments we're hearing about people feeling on edge, uncomfortable, um, not confident, not sure of uh, how to act, and uh, trying to get a handle on it. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and we, we leave each meeting, I, I leave each meeting holding my head because I feel like we're trying to remake society or something. But that is one of the things that schools have to wrestle with. If we're going to conduct school in a just community, uh, we have to be willing to look at how, how we're doing it and how we're, we're not only our discipline regulations, but what are the signals we send out. Um, how do we deal with parents? How do you know how do parents deal with us? And all those kinds of interactions have to be looked at. Gina? Have there been any thoughts about whether the behaviors that you're describing with students as, as far as I got a 97, you got a 96, and respecting one another and, and uh, the way they interact on the playground, are these behaviors um, ones that have been going on for a long time and it's just never been talked about? Or is there something happening within the society itself or with this particular generation of kids that, that it's just surfacing more and, and is more, um, you know, there's a lot, a lot more prevalent? I don't know. I mean, it's, um, uh, the, you hear some speculation about that. I have had conversations with groups of teachers. I know we've talked about it administratively. Um, uh, we're certainly, I'm certainly not prepared to answer that question, but it is one of the issues that has been uh, been raised. And it is, I think, a, a prime reason for talking to parents. Uh, I think we all need to kind of get a handle on this and say, if you're feeling confused about some behaviors, um, you know, so are we, what are we going to do about it? I mean, some of this could be fairly simple, I think, in the sense of just laying down the law. 
you know, you really basically don't have to get too analytic about don't punch somebody. Uh, and what are we going to do about it? Although I have to say, we need to have communication with parents so that uh, if, you know, we do sometimes have problems when one parent will not agree with the school discipline on, on something and will feel that we have, we have uh, been too harsh or something of that sort. That's, again, another reason I think why we have to involve parents to understand that this isn't just an isolated instance. We have to be, we really want to run a respectful school. I guess that was one of the things I was wondering was how much have we loosened up and, and what behaviors are coming from that if we have. And, and the other thing was that I was really struck after reading the learning gap um, in this article to read the paragraph that talked about um, in the long run it may be better for students to learn to view their mistakes and the feedback that accompanies these as sources of information for future efforts rather than as evidence of low ability. Mm -hmm. I mean, the two just match beautifully. Mm -hmm. They do. I'm, I'm anxious to have those discussions. Okay. Yes, just two comments. One, uh, just as a small sidelight in how long this behavior has been around. I know it was around when I was in school, so it's been at least several years in the making. And then to reinforce the point that uh, Superintendent Goldman just made, I really do feel, and many, many parents have addressed this to me, that some of it is just simply laying down the law. The behavior that you're describing was certainly around uh, when I was in school. I was more cognizant of a law that had been laid down. Um, so just to pass on parental input and my own personal biases on that particular subject. Yeah. The other thing is uh, we not only need to lay down the law, but we need to lay it down consistently for everybody every time it's done and not change the rules depending on, you know, parental pressures or, or something like that. We need to be very clear up front what the rules are and enforce them for everybody, you know, from, you know, appropriately at each grade level. But I think that's certainly an issue that needs to be addressed, too. But I, I, I must say I've had... Um, numerous comments from uh, parents of uh, elementary school kids about the m meanness, um, which, which I have found unusual. You know, I've had kids, you know, in the schools for five years now, and they're just, there does seem to be a lot of awareness of, of kids just being plain old mean to each other. And um, actually I had a conversation with the elementary um, guidance counselor today about that and she said she's also gotten more comments about that and she's she's trying to work on that but I think clearly all of us as adults need to be much more aware of how kids are treating each other and intervene when it's when it's necessary not all these battles are battles that they can fight at least at the in the early early years one of the one of the actually a couple of the keynote speakers at the coalition forum stressed the respect element in, in education. In order for kids to learn, they've got to have respect. And there's got to be respect to teachers for students and students for students. Otherwise, you're not going to go anywhere. You know, I just uh, spent uh, a couple of weeks ago, a day and a half, at a uh, prep school, which uh, uh, has a very, very diverse student body. Uh, rich, poor, black, Asian, Hispanic, white, uh, just about, and, and foreign. And uh, we spent uh, probably five or six, seven hours all together with students. And it was extraordinary how often that theme of tolerance, of diversity, uh, came up. And uh, not, not, you know, from the students themselves. And uh, it gave me a wonderful feeling uh, because they really felt that they couldn't do anything. They couldn't function as a group, and they did a lot of group learning uh, unless they... Uh, drew strength and information and inspiration from the other's differences. And it was really a wonderful thing, wonderful warm feeling, and I really don't think it was an act they were putting on for the, you know, 15 alumni that they had invited back for this, uh, this session. Uh, I do think, uh, however, that uh, as I finish up this process of traveling all over the country, uh, and, uh, you know, as you, you mentioned, the uh, going to, uh, you know, a different region, uh, you do see uh, something very different than you see in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I am convinced that uh, society is changing quite a lot, maybe not so much in this relatively homogeneous uh, society, but 
Uh, certainly out there in America, they're, they're all, the pot is boiling and lots of things are going on. Uh, I think that uh, what our children watch on television has changed a lot. It probably is changing every 10 years significantly. Uh, maybe that's a factor. Maybe we have relaxed a little bit in laying down the law, and I certainly believe that we ought to lay down the law consistently. But I think also we may be just reaching that point where the iceberg is appearing over the horizon. And if we're seeing meanness or if we're seeing other problems, it, it may be that there's more coming. And so I think it's quite appropriate that we do what we're doing and react uh, uh, sooner, and I really commend the efforts of this group to, you know, get moving on this. Ian. I was just thinking about what Janet said, is, is this a societal problem or whatever? Well, certainly the um, election just passed shows how, how far we've come. I mean, when you see, you know, people who are running for president or running for high office slinging mud at each other and not showing respect for each other or for the process either, you know, I think, I think we do have a really, um, a, a big tide um, that we have to fight against in that way of showing respect for each other. And uh, I think it is, I think what Peter said is right, it is the iceberg issue, and uh, I'm glad we're dealing with it. I just want to point out that um, there is always a balance line in things, and, you know, the good news about Cape Elizabeth is that our kids uh, for the most part, care about doing a good job, you know? The, and I wouldn't want to leave the impression that I think that the kids are somehow chopping each other up, although I do think there's pieces of behavior we need to review. I, I get the impression that they are actually on edge themselves, uh, and that there is a sense of, um, among some youngsters, not all of them, uh, I want to do a good job, but I'm not sure, you know, what is good? I mean, you know, is it A or A plus or A plus plus or, or what have you? And um, it's an anxiety that gets bred into uh, how good is good. And I think we have to help them with that. And I think that there are, there really are um, strategies that young children can be taught to think about themselves as a learner, how to work together in groups. We talk about change and why change. One of the things that our schools, especially a school like ours, it's small and has a fairly focused academic mission. Uh, we have many parents, I think, who are uncomfortable with the idea of group learning, yet you're hearing at a prestigious private school that group learning is considered very important. Um, it is not easy to get parents to understand that group learning is something other than two or three kids standing around waiting for the uh, most academically able youngster in the group to do the project. Clearly, we have to teach kids how to work together in groups. It is an important goal, and it's one that we didn't used to have. So that for many parents, this becomes an issue that we do need to invite them into the conversation and stress how important it is to teach them how to do that together. It is not a matter of losing your A plus or being cheated out of a good grade because somebody else is working with you. It's not an easy issue, and it's not one that I would say that teachers should say, okay, today we're going to do group work without any training. That never works well. But we do have to come, we have to crunch that issue. We have to understand that that's a world kids are going into, and I think it's, piece, it's one of my suggestions for why we have to change, because the world kids are going into is going to require that kind of thing. It's also going to require individual discipline individual ability to do discipline research on your own and so on. It doesn't mean that everything is a group project, but those are just, those are some of the crosshatches here between respect and an atmosphere, a positive atmosphere to uh, generate um, a just community and the academic issues that we want to enhance. I do believe the two go together. Jane. I think your point is really important though about the teacher training because I, I would hope that the principals would make sure that teachers do have the training before they just decide to do it on their own because I think it, in some instances maybe that's happened where teachers have just mm -hmm. said let's do group work and and then that's why parents get the perception of it that they do because it hasn't worked for their that's child right. or it hasn't been effective. Yeah. True enough. Loretta. Well I, I would just like to add that I just returned from a parents weekend at Duke University and I was there for three days 
and each day that I attended different functions. The first day I was, we were allowed to go to classes and uh, I, I, I went to a social psychology class and this is what we were talking about, is relationships among people and diverse people and getting along and, and working together. Uh, the second day uh, we had a question and answer with the president of the university. This came up time and time again, the diversity of the student body, how they got along. Uh, on Sunday, there was a, a, a class for parents on uh, what, what we want you to know about your students. And it was uh, the head of the Divinity School talked. And here again, this is what it was about. And, uh, and so I think this is happening not only in all, or, or should be happening and should be discussed and should be looked into in, in all of the public schools and as well as the colleges. It's just it's just an issue that, that all students are facing. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Uh, the next meeting of the diversity committee is on December 7th at 11 to 1 p.m. in the superintendent's conference room. Mm -hmm. And it is open to the public for anyone who is interested. And having attended three of, three of the four meetings, it's very spirited conversation. And what I, they perceived it was getting to be very global, I think it actually has to be global. Right. It's just that if you want to get something done, <laughs> it drives you crazy. But I think uh, I just would, would amend uh, people are very welcome, and we're finding that that is uh, a rich resource for us. Uh, we have decided we will probably try to focus our, um, you know, our, my, well, I think I'm the only one, my sense of getting getting something actually, you know, the action plan phase, although we've done some pieces, but we haven't really got a clear action phase. Uh, so people are welcome to come, but they may in fact be asked not to take an active role, but be to be there as, as observers and so forth. Um, the next item is the Middle School Building Project Committee. Um, we decided as a board and the town council decided as a board to proceed in forming a build, uh, main uh, middle school building committee. Um, it was given to the charge of the chairman of the um, town council appointments committee that we would use his process. Um, we appointed Ann Chapman and Jan Sol and myself to join with three of the town councilors, um, Dick Dahlbeck, Herb Chappelle, and Wayne Creelman, on the night that they met to go over the applicants. I was in Philadelphia, so Jan and Ann attended. Uh, I've asked Jan to kind of give you an overview of that process and their decision. Mm -hmm. She would please. Um, yes, Wayne Creelman and Dick Dahlbeck from town council were there and Ann and I from school board and we did um, interviews, we interviewed um, I believe nine applicants in 15 minute segments and they had filled out applications ahead of time which we reviewed and then we discussed with them, asked them questions, um, um, their views about the, uh, the middle school building project. And um, then we came up with a list of recommendations, which went before town council last night, and they voted on. Um, the, the recommendations are for the Cape Elizabeth Middle School Building Committee, Paula Liberty for chairman, um, then of course Richard Dahlbeck and William Jordan representing town council, Ann Chapman and Charles Greer representing school board, and then the members from the community, Robert Howe, Philip Philbrick, Michael Roy, and Jeffrey White, and ex officio members, uh, Dr. Goldman and Michael McGovern. And so tonight, I think as a board, we need to vote as town council did last night. It was a very, uh, a wonderful evening. I mean, it was terrific to see all the applicants and all the interest, and people had really good ideas and, and really showed a lot of enthusiasm and willingness to uh, spend the amount of time needed to to work on this and, and um, talk about it to the, uh, to the community. The action, thank you, Jean. The action that the town council did last night was to approve the building committee as stands, what is listed below. Um, 
I will make just one comment that in talking to Jan today, she showed an interest in, in joining this committee. And what I, because of the action of the town council last night, I, I would like you to approve the building committee as presented. But I've asked Jan to be an alternate school board member to that committee for some reason that, that Ann or I have to step down, that she would be our next, our, so that if we could not attend a meeting, that she would attend in our absence. So if that meets with the pleasure of the board. Um, I would entertain a motion. Um, I move that we accept the uh, people that I just listed to be on the Cape Elizabeth Middle School Building Committee. Do I second? Seconded by Peter. Any discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. I would now charge the um, superintendent and the chairman, Paul LaLiberté, I believe he has met with the, yes. with the uh, superintendent, to send out letters to the board, uh, to the committee, uh, welcoming them on the award, and um, possibly setting up the meeting for the first meeting. Yes, as a matter of fact, I was um, delighted uh, not only with the entire committee and the interest, um, but I happened to have worked uh, with Paul Liberty when I was the superintendent at Gorham. His um, company was the one who actually built the school that I was uh, involved with building. So I know firsthand the quality of his work, uh, his expertise, and uh, furthermore, his uh, really enormous interest in what he's doing. So I know that we will be very well served. He and I walked through the middle school and Pond Cove, um, I think it was yesterday, what day is today? It must have been yesterday. And um, it's an eye-opening experience, particularly for somebody who knows buildings as Paul does. Um, we, I deliberately chose to go in the afternoon after the, most of the students had left because it really reveals um, a lot of empty spaces and we went right through from soup to nuts. Um, he recognizes, of course, the dimension of the need and the importance of getting going uh, promptly and quickly, and we will do that. I've also, I'm preparing a packet of materials for all members of the committee. I gave what I had to Paul yesterday, the copies of the School Space Study Committee, the old NASDAQ report, um, basically trying to prepare a summary for this committee. Our goal, hopefully, will to have and this may be a little ambitious, but to have three meetings between now and uh, Christmas so that we could have an organizational meeting and two working meetings. Um, essentially, the decisions that will be facing this committee will be one of getting a handle on the timeline, determining uh, the process we will use for the architect um, and the charge for concept design, looking at what budget we have, how to use it, what are the issues we need to understand uh, in order to, to do that kind of thing. Obviously, we have to talk about um, community outreach um, uh, information, how to get people really involved in understanding our need. Um, and the other important issue that we'll be looking at is, uh, uh, since the, the, the renovation is so massive, uh, we certainly cannot talk about doing uh, the kind of thing in the summer that is needed. So we will be drawing up a plan. How do we go to school? How do we provide appropriate spaces for children and teachers to go to school. And it will be, um, I guess, would be a three to four year plan, phase in plan. And I, um, as I reported, I think at our last meeting, or maybe I didn't, but anyway, I also had a walk through with the State Department people uh, last week, and they tell me they'll give us a, some kind of indication on the Pond Cove proposal by the middle of December. So there's a great deal of work ahead of us. I know I've been through it. And, uh, but it's exciting. And I think that what the community needs to understand is that um, this group, uh, plus yourselves, plus the staff, we are basically shaping the school uh, design of two thirds of our schools um, for the next generation. And we will be doing that, taking into consideration everything we know about what kind of educational opportunity we want these kids to have. Um, and it is an exciting process. I think we'll have good help and um, we'll get somewhere. So thank you. I'd like to commend the, the appointments, co the combined appointments committee uh, for, their, for their work. Um, the charge was that each of the boards would appoint two and they decided due to the quality of the candidates and to 
to present a unified front that they recommend as a, as a block, and I think that was very sound judgment. I want to thank my counterpart, the town council chairman, Janet McLaughlin, for the number of conversations we've had on the phone in trying to find a, a chairman who would take charge, and I found that a very cooperative venture also. So I thank her also. Uh, we now move on to new business. Discussion and action as needed to set a workshop in early December. I did ask um, uh, Frank to research what uh, dates were available at this time of year. Of course, our normal fourth Tuesday falls, you know, uh, Thanksgiving week, which does not bode well for a, a workshop. So we're not really looking at that day. Um, and of course, between now and the holiday break, there is just, you know, there are innumerable school functions and various other issues. So if we're looking at a workshop date, uh, the 1st, 2nd, or 3rd of December, or the 10th or 17th appear to pop out as days that do not conflict with anything on the community services calendar. The 10th or 17th uh, are Thursdays. Um, one of the issues that I, I've been wrestling with myself, and I put a couple of notes in, in the agenda notes, whether we ought to um, really push for a coalition meeting and invite parents uh, throughout the system. If you have elementary children, you know, the idea that you need to be aware of this, um, whether that's the best use of, of really what is, in effect, limited time. Uh, we did, of course, do a curriculum workshop last month, and uh, I sort of thought in the normal process of things we would start talking about language arts, um, and we could, we can do that, although our language arts situation, K-12, is not as clear as our math situation, but we certainly have many separate pieces to present. Um, I guess those are my two suggestions, and I would uh, ask you for, for your input. Anybody? Jan? Well, I'd like to suggest that we have one for each topic. I mean, I, I, I'm getting worried that it's already December, and I really want to know what's happening with language arts, and the coalition is coming up soon. I, I just, I'd, I'd, I'd like to do that. I don't believe you were suggesting that we combine these in one workshop. You oh, were, Lord, no. No, no, no. no. I think she was looking for two, se I know, two I separate ones, which two she, separate. I think we're looking for a direction from the board which they want to look at in December. Mark? The, my understanding is we will be receiving a report from the teachers and administration in February concerning the coalition. Yes. And at our last uh, workshop, we had talked about putting together certain numbers and further study about the coalition and how it relates. I, m my thought is that it may be helpful to have more time than just this December to put together a more comprehensive package to present to both parents and school board members in a workshop format, and perhaps January would be appropriate for that, and then this December we could look at a language arts strand. Oh, okay. Yeah, actually what I was saying is two separate nights, not two in one night. I would, I would guess that the high school might want to have an informal kind of parent meeting, but that could be something the high school could set up uh, rather than use the umbrella of the school board. And, uh, but the school board would obviously be informed if that were going on, so that do it in that way. So is it the... Uh, well, I, I just want to make sure I understand the the high school is going to be making a recommendation to us in February mm -hmm. as to whether or not to join. They're, uh, what they're, where they're, you know, they're, the, what, what we are talking about right now is that they will make a recommendation. Where are they as to particular, because this is a decision that should be made, as it says throughout all the literature, um, with everybody on board, maybe not every single last teacher, but certainly the majority. And, if we come back, if they come back after looking through this and say, well, we've decided this isn't what we want to do, uh, it probably clarifies it for the board. On the other hand, if they come back saying, this is what we want to do, and these are the reasons why, and this is the way we analyze it, and so on, then you have a decision to make. I guess I'm a little unclear about when there's going to ever be public input on this or public information given so that 
I assume in order to make this decision, the high school needs that information and not wait until they have a recommendation and ask for a reaction to it. Right. That, that's See why we're saying? suggesting a January mm -hmm. workshop prior to the February recommendation, mm -hmm. or we could do it sooner in December. Maybe, maybe that does make sense, but I'm just wondering at that point, would we have the answers to the questions we asked at the last workshop? Because they're, they're probably similar questions that would be asked by the public. 